love-hate relationship with the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise in general. I mean, you started off with the first film that nobody was really expecting to be good. Nobody went into the first Pirates going, Oh my god, this is going to be such a great motion picture event. No, we all went, Oh, it's got Johnny Depp in it, Orlando Bloom. Yeah, I remember that guy from, like, Lord of the Rings. Sure, let's go see this on a pure curiosity note. It's probably going to suck, but it's got a great cast, so... You know, Jeffrey Rush is in it. He's like a British go-to guy when you want to have a cool actor in there. So maybe it'll turn out to be okay, you know. Maybe I'll have wasted eight bucks to go see it. And then you walked out, and your eyes were all wide, and you were just so happy because you were in complete disbelief of how just freaking amazing the thing you just saw was. You're just get, you were giggling all the way through. You saw Captain Jack Sparrow, who's like a complete... Like, oh my god, he's a shocker the first time that you see him. When he waddles onto the screen and his, like, boat is sinking. Everybody, everybody coming out of that movie went, oh my goodness, Johnny Depp was amazing. There's a few people who didn't. There's a few people who were like, yeah, man, Johnny Depp is overrated as an actor. I don't really think he's that good. He isn't like Christian Bale or anything. He isn't, like, brilliant. And to them, I say, to hell with you, Johnny Depp is freaking amazing, and he made the original Pirates. Then you go into number two, and the expectations have been raised significantly. And I think the thing is that people weren't even expecting a Pirates of the Caribbean movie anymore. Now people were expecting something more. They were expecting to be blown away again. And that's really high expectations for a movie to live up to, especially when the first one, like, it was just based off of an amusement park ride, for Pete's sakes. It was just a fun pirate story with, like, skeletons, like, dueling each other. And it worked. It worked because it was so simplistic. Then you go into the second one, and everything's all convoluted. There's, like, 50 billion plot lines all over the place. And then there's, like, fishmen, pirates. And then there's, like, all these jokes borrowed from the first movie, which is, like, that is the most wonderful gimmick, I swear, in sequels. Is Let's just borrow the gags from the first movie because everybody likes those. It's nostalgia. Nostalgia is a beautiful beautiful concept. Uh, nobody really cared for the second one. I think there were some people who came out of it. I'm not going to judge anybody because, you know, everybody has their own tastes and things, so I suppose I have to be a little bit more lenient. But just speaking from experience, almost everybody walked out and said, yeah, that was pretty good. I hope the third one's better. I'm sure the third one's going to be better. This is just like setting things up. And everybody was like, sort of brushing off the second one, hoping that the third installment was just going to be amazing, and then the third one came out, and... Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> that was just the end of it. That was the end of Pirates of the Caribbean for most people. Like, try and watch that movie, and try to make coherent sense of the whole thing. There's some fun sword fights and everything, but my... My goodness. Like, get some new screenwriters in there. I blame Disney entirely. Because if you watch the making of The Pirates of the Caribbean, these writers and the director were on a tight schedule. Because Disney wanted these things just, like, completely popped out, like, back to back. Because the first one was such a phenomenal hit. And guess what? They made a whole boatload of money. No pun intended. They made a black pearl full of money. And money was just dripping from the black sails. And Mickey Mouse was sailing at the front of it with his really bad pirate impersonation. Now we're entering Pirates 4. We have been burned twice. Or at least many of us have. And now we're just sitting here wondering, you know, why would you bother to go see another Pirates of the Caribbean movie? Like, after all of that had happened, everything, why would you bother to just, like, have them kick you in the crotch again? I'll tell you what. I went in with absolutely no expectations. I was expecting it to suck. I paid for the ticket. I read the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, which were just excruciatingly bad. The worst kind of reviews you could possibly imagine when coming into a movie like this. When something has a 33%, that's like a guaranteed, like, cow marking. <laughs> cow dung marking that this is just going to be, this is going to be terrible. But I paid the money anyways. I went by myself. That way I didn't have to feel guilty that I dragged anybody with me. And I sat back and I was like, okay, pirates, prove me wrong, please. I know you're going to suck, but just by some slight miracle, let's wish upon a star that you aren't going to suck. And guess what? It didn't suck. I was just in such relief at the fact that it didn't completely blow. I wasn't bored throughout this movie. In fact, I found it quite entertaining. And la la la! Let me, before I get ahead of myself, I don't want to say that this is a good movie, because it really isn't. There's a lot of things in this that are just sloppy. It's the plot 
in and of itself is basically a way to string together little comedy routines with the Jack Sparrow character, get him into tight spots so that he can get out of them, but you know what? I'm happy with that. Because the plot is simple. It's a, you know, typical Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of like, oh, we have to go here and get this sort of artifact, and oh, we have to hunt down this particular creature to get its tears. It's all very, like, formulaic stuff, and I can follow it. It's just, it's perfectly fine, just as long as it knows what it is. And this knows what it is. It knows that the plot isn't the important element here. And so it spends a lot of time on the characterization of Jack Sparrow and the way he interacts with the rest of the characters in the film, such as the Penelope Cruz character who was just introduced, who is Blackbeard's daughter. And the two of them have, like, this wonderful sexual tension when they're on screen. I swear, when Johnny Depp and Penelope Cruz together like, on screen at the same time, like, that screen just reeks sex. Everybody in the theater. Like, if you're not watching this going, like, you're just anticipating the point where it's all of a sudden going to take this horrible X-rated turn, and suddenly, like, Johnny Depp and Penelope Cruz are just, like, ripping each other's clothes off, and it's like, ching, 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 ching. But no, it doesn't end up being that way, because it's Disney. But you're waiting for it, because that's how much sexual tension is within those scenes. There's just, like, real chemistry and sparks flying between the two of them, and they just look good together. I know this sounds like a horrible, like, anime fan sort of thing, because they always do this. Like, they start pairing people off based off of their hair color. But it's like, they even look the same. She kind of looks like a little more petite version of Jack Sparrow. Like, um, this compared to, you know, the crazy love triangle that was in 2 and 3, I am okay with this. And every scene that they're in is hilarious, because the interplay is just so genuine. It doesn't feel as forced as, you know, the whole Elizabeth Turner turn that they did, which is, I don't even want to talk about it. I even feel dirty the entire sequence where uh, Elizabeth Turner and Dead Man's Chess literally um, handcuffed the Johnny Depp character to the side of the ship and fed him to the crack, and it's just, that was not Pirates of the Caribbean to me. That was not what I had paid to go see. So let's talk about the negatives. The cinematography pretty much sucked for the most part. Rob Marshall is no Gore Verbinski. Even the problem with Dead Man's Chest and with That World's End was not the direction. I, I want to make that abundantly clear. It was with the fundamental story in general. It really lost track of what made Pirates of the Caribbean special as a franchise. And part of the whole thing is the first film, the reason why everybody liked it was because it was a treasure hunt movie that still happened to have little supernatural elements that would sort of crop up at random. And then in the second and third movie, they went, oh, people really like the supernatural element, so we're going to make just the entire fucking thing like a big old supernatural orgy where just things are coming out everywhere, and then there's fish people, and then there's gods and goddesses, and then there's a whirlpool, and then all the boats are going to start firing at each other within the whirlpool, and it's just going to be crazy, insane crap happening everywhere. And this one, despite Rob Marshall's direction, which is bland as heck, I mean, he literally just places the camera on top of people, and they just sort of work around it. There's none of, like, the flow that you saw in the previous Pirates of the Caribbean films. But it's more character-driven than those films really were. Because you're able to really get into it. Because there isn't so much insanity going on. This is just much more subdued. Much more, I would even say, confident. It's not trying to constantly impress you with one huge action sequence after another after another. And the moments where it really does kick in, like the mermaid attack, which really isn't much of a spoiler if you've seen the trailer, like there's a little guy out on a boat within the trailer, and you see just like this mermaid jump out of the water and like just nail this guy, knock him straight off of the boat. And there's an entire sequence that just knocked my socks off with the mermaids. And it was so imaginative and so fun in the way the skeleton attacks were in the first Pirates of the Caribbean, and I didn't think that I would feel this way watching the movie, even when the finale dragged on and on and on and it wouldn't end, even when I was sitting there going, I really wish that, you know, on top of all the fun and all the great little comedic moments, I wish that maybe they had developed the plot a little bit more. It was still a good time. I had a good time in the theater while I was watching it. Maybe it was because of the lowered expectations, but sometimes that isn't such a bad thing, going into something and just saying, okay, I'm just going to watch a movie that's probably going to suck, and then having it be just okay. I would recommend that if this comes out on video, you, you run it. Give it a shot. Even if you hated 
at World's End like I did. Just, just give it a chance. Maybe it will win you over like it did with me, and maybe you'll be completely just in love with the entire idea of Johnny Depp and Penelope Cruz, like, prancing down a beach with their hands held and looking lovey-dovey into each other's eyes like this. And this is Johnny Depp right here, and this is Penelope Cruz, and they're just, like, looking into each other's eyes. And then the fan fiction magic happens. So if I were to give this a rating, um, see, I'm stuck between a two and a half out of five and a three. And not in the bad way. This isn't like one of those two and a half out of fives. It's more of an honest rating because the production really isn't as top notch as it could have been. If this had been directed by Gore Verbinski with this script, I think it would have been easily like a three and a half or a four. But as it is, it's a three. It's a good, solid, fun time. If it's on Netflix streaming, I would watch it immediately, especially if you're a fan of this particular franchise. It just feels good to have a pirate movie. It's not necessarily feel like a Pirates of the Caribbean movie because that has a bad stigma to it now. No, this feels like one of those pirate movies that you would have watched on, like, TNN or something, like back when they used to play those manly movies for guys who like movies, sort of action swashbucklers. You could totally see this plot fitting within that. It just has a bigger budget and it's more Disney-fied and it has a bit more magic to it. And I guess that's all I have to say about that. I just, I love it when I'm surprised. Can I just say that? Even if it's a minor surprise, I like it when something blows my expectations out of the water. And this completely didn't. I don't think it deserves the amount of shit that it has been getting. I think people are just sick of this franchise in general. Understandably, it's something that's been run into the ground. But I think Jack Sparrow as a character could be the next James Bond. Like, you could just stick him in random situations involving other pirates and stuff and completely come up with crazy, off-the-wall, fun plots. And that's what I suggest they do with this franchise. Don't, like, try to make it an epic again. Don't try to make any trilogies with Pirates of the Caribbean. Just have it be Jack Sparrow doing what Jack Sparrow does, maybe with another sexy sidekick, and voila, we have movie box office gold, I think. Because people return to this stuff. People like to turn off their brains and just enjoy something really popcorn-y every so often. I know I do. So that is the end of my analysis of Pirates of the Caribbean 4 on Stranger Tides. I hope to catch you guys again real soon. Mwah, 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 mwah.